this week I've begun the process of setting up a new Bible. And for anybody that's not familiar with it, this is the KJV Journal of the Word Bible. It is published by Thomas Nelson and it's the large print edition. And as some of you know, I've been using a KJV Journal of the Word large print edition. I started back in July 2021 in this Bible. So I've really enjoyed this Bible. It has the two inches of margins, the cream colored pages, and then it also has the larger print. So there's a little bit more space between the lines that you can write your notes. But one thing I'm finding as I've collected more and more notes, as I've come into this truth of the Bible, that my notes are getting messier and messier. And I'm hoping that I'll find a way to write my notes bigger and like I probably won't use the orange color because I found that the orange color is a little bit harder to read. Little tweaks. And so I'm beginning this journey of moving from this Bible into this one and it is going to be a multi-step process and I don't know how long it's going to take transition fully from this Bible into this Bible. So I've just finished the first part of going into this Bible and that is adding the inserts to my Bible. As you watch this video, you might decide that I have way too many inserts, but I've just found that I really enjoy having the inserts. I wanna tell you the cons of this at the very beginning, just so that you have this information. One of them is that this paper is thicker than this paper, and so when you open it up, it often will just spring back on you, and this one might not do it as much but I find that happens a lot. Another thing is if you're looking for a section of scripture and it's between two inserts, sometimes it can be hard to get in between. It's harder to flip there. So like if you're in a study at church and you're trying to get to a section quickly, it might take a bit to get there. So it's a little bit of an irritation. One thing that you won't find in my Bible are little flaps that cover the word or sticky notes that cover the word. And I know sticky notes are easy to take off and flaps, you just move them up. But I like the least amount of distraction possible. And I find that inserts for me are a little bit distracting because you get to the end of the page and you have to turn to the next page. So that's kind of my limit on distractions of what I prefer for my Bible. But I do like having information in there. The last con I want to mention is as others have said, if you add too many inserts, you're going to end up damaging your binding. So you do want to think about what you're adding. So you would not ever want to add a sheet in between every single page. It would be just too much for this binding to support. But it definitely, I think the amount of inserts that I have added are not stressing the binding at all. And I do plan to add more, especially when I get to Revelation. And just as needed, as I'm writing my notes up, I know I'm going to come up with more things that I want to type up and just add with pictures. So at this point, this is what I have and it's worked well. So those are all the cons that I can think of at this point. And now I can go ahead and start showing the inserts that I have added to this Bible. So as we open, I've actually just stuck this into my Bible. It's the seven I am statements of Jesus. And with my other Bible that I've been using, I have those highlighted, but I think this might be a nice thing to add to my Bible. I might reprint this so it's a full page, but at this point I've just stuck it in there because I'm not sure. And one thing about this video, it might be easier instead of watching this on your phone to see the charts and maps if you're using a laptop or a computer monitor or a TV, but however it works for you. So this first one is from Conforming to Jesus. They have one on the maps of the books of the Bible. So I inserted it right next to the table of contents. Another thing I should mention is I cut them to size and then I just run a glue stick along the edge of the page and stick it in. And I do have a video on that process and I'll link that in the description box. But so this shows where each of the books are and their belief for whatever reason is that the Song of Solomon should not be included. So it's not on here. But beyond that, I was thinking this was kind of a neat little chart. So I included that into my Bible. Then I like having timelines. This one is a little bit harder to read, but what I did is I did a legal size paper and on this half I did this one. And then I found this one somewhere. So you can just find some charts, some timelines. And then on the inside, the reason I did the legal size is because I found this. So if you Google search a timeline of biblical history, you'll find this. And I have not confirmed that all these dates are accurate, but it's just an interesting way to see the flow of the Bible. So I like having that in there. I think that's gonna be fun to have. Then in this Bible, I get that blank Old Testament sheet. And then I had seen this one, and it's a very vague kind of thing, but I just thought it was really cute. 
And then on the other side, I found these boxes online and then I added the seventh day because I didn't have it, even though that was a day that God created. And then I added some text blocks here and I added some other information. This is Hebrews 4. And I like this. God created everything in the world before us without our help and for us. And then Sabbath reminds us of everything God did for us in the creation and recreation, which was through Christ. We rest to remember this. We don't keep it in order to be saved. We keep it to remind us to rest in Jesus. That's what that seventh day Sabbath is all about. And that's what Hebrews four talks about. So I want to be reminded of that as I go through the creation story. When we come to Genesis five, verse five, it says in all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And then it goes into the genealogy. And I found this chart on conforming to Jesus. And so I've included that. It's got visual representation all the way to Abraham. And a lot of these are blank on the back. And it would have been nice to think of something to put there, but I didn't. So it's a space for notes if I want to on these people. One of my goals is to go through an every person that's in the line of Jesus to notate them in some way. Then when we get to Genesis 10, this is right after the flood and it's Noah's descendants. And we have Japheth, Ham, and Shem. And I found this, the founding of the nations. I think it might be the table of nations. And it's really interesting. It has Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and then their descendants. And then these were the tribes in India. These are the Arabian tribes, the land of Canaan, and it just follows through. And I thought this was a really nice chart. And you should see that just by putting in genealogy. I think maybe the table of nations. This one's called the founding of the nation. And on the back side, I also found this, but when I printed it out, I realized the writing's a little bit difficult, but since it printed out, it wasn't hurting anything. I just left it on the back side of this. So I don't know if I'd recommend this chart, but it's not gonna hurt anything to have it in there. And here we have where they settled, the descendants of Noah. And then this section of Canaan, they have a larger representation here, so you can see it better. And then this last thing here is Genesis 10 verse 25. And unto Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided and his brother's name was Joktan. Now I'm not sure if the earth being divided means this, but someone had mentioned it and I just thought that's really interesting. And this is that Pangea. If you look up Pangea, you'll find little different representations. And I just chose these two and stuck them at the top. And Peleg's name means H6389 means divided. And in this Strong's, it said it's the same as H6388 earthquake. And they say along the continental divides, that's where you get the earthquakes. And so that might be how they separated. And I just find it very interesting. You can see how they can kind of fit together. So I just find that interesting. And then in a video that I watched online, someone's channel, they mentioned Genesis 11, how verses one through nine are chiasm. And it's all about how the people didn't want to be dispersed and then God dispersed them. So I added in some text boxes with some extra information. I found this online. And so I just think it's neat to go along with that. And then Genesis 11, again, we have some genealogy and then Abram being called out. And so this was again from conforming to Jesus and it has a genealogy going all the way to Abraham's descendants. And so then it mentions mother children like Hagar with Ishmael Keturah. So I like that. In here, I also have another one of these charts where it shows the lifespan of people and the flood and the Tower of Babel. So I included that. There's nothing on this side and then a map. It's the journey of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob conform and that's in the conforming to Jesus site. And this is again with Genesis 12. I just stuck those all together. And it can be so nice sometimes to visualize what happens. So here again, we have another genealogy and this is Genesis 25. And I liked the looks of this one. I think this was all together. And I added this about Psalm 90 verse 10, the lifespan equals 70 years is in that. And then I found this somewhere else and I just stuck it on the top. 
So this would be one if you want it to look just like this, this insert. If you're interested in it, you'll need to email me or just create one yourself, um, whatever you'd like to do. And then in Genesis 30, there's more information about the children. And so I stuck this one in here and what I'm gonna do is add in which number that they were born because I like having that information and it's also neat because it has Keturah's children here and Ishmael. So really just some variety. And some of them are better than others. And I could have just stuck the same one in every place, but just for a little variety, I added this one in, in this spot. Then we come to Genesis 35, and it's talking about Jacob's descendants and the death of Isaac. And Esau's descendants are here in chapter 36. And this chart does go into Esau's descendants. And so it's just a visual representation of what we're reading. And this is neat too, because it does have Genesis 36, Genesis 28, nine. There's some different verses where they got this information from. So I like that. And this is another one from conforming to Jesus. So here in Genesis 49, it's talking about the sons and it does do them in order. So I have this genealogy and it does have them already ordered. And this is again at conforming to Jesus. And that's the end of the book of Genesis. As we move into Exodus, between that I added this and I thought this was a really neat chart. And what I did, they had this as a long document beside and I just kind of shrunk it up and fit it so it's right underneath. And I love this because number one, and it will show you the Bible verses that go with it. And it was just something that randomly came up for me. If you want a copy of this, let me know if you can't find it yourself. Uh, and then also this sheet is blank. And then I found this also, this Exodus from Egypt, and it has a little write-up on each spot. I think for the search engine, I had written something like the map of the Exodus from Egypt or the timeline for the Exodus, and it's just some random things that popped up. Here was another thing that popped up, and it's really small, hard to read, so I really could have left this one out and just done this one and this one and called it good. But I kind of like the pictures that are in here, so I left it in there. And when you see pictures online, I should mention this, I think on a PC, you right click and you can copy the picture, put into Word and size it to the right size. With the Apple computer, you do control and then your mouse and you can copy the picture, paste it into Word. So that's how I do it. So starting in Exodus chapter seven, verse 10, we see Aaron's rod becomes a serpent. And that was the first miracle. And so what I did, I found this chart and then I added lines. So the first, actual first thing that happened was Aaron's rod became a serpent. And then we have these plagues and these first two, the magicians were able to copy. And then number three through 10, the magicians were not able to copy. So I put that with the red box. And then we have all people are affected by plagues one through three, and then God's people were unaffected by the last seven plagues, number four through 10. The one thing that this doesn't include is that each of these plagues had to do with a God of Egypt. And so it would have been nice to have that information in there. And so I might add another sheet in there, maybe right here, and it will go through each of the plagues, how they were representing a God for Egypt. I find that very fascinating that God so carefully gives them what they worship okay, you're worshiping the god of gnats or the god of frogs, so here I'll give you a lot of frogs. Then we come to Exodus 20, and this is connected to the seal of God, so I have information on that, and that's one of the videos on my channel about marked versus sealed, and so you can see how the Ten Commandments were changed. So like the second commandment, you shall not make it for yourself an idol, that was taken out. The fourth commandment, they changed it to just the Lord's day. And then they separated to make it still be 10. They took the 10th one and split it into two. And here we have the seal of God versus the mark of the beast and some of the key verses that go with that. And this is a representation of a seal and then some of the quotes of the antichrist system. So that's an insert from one of my videos. Something that I wanna have a fuller understanding of is the tabernacle, the sanctuary because it is, we find out in Hebrews, that what's on earth was a model representation of what was in heaven. And the high priest, we find out that Jesus is our high priest and his outfit matched with the high priest is. So I want to have an understanding of that. And the nice thing about this chart is that you can go through and see verses that are related. But as you read your Bible, as you're studying the Old Testament, it can add to your understanding. So I'm glad to have all of this information in my Bible as I seek to understand the Bible more fully. 
So I chose to put that in before Exodus 25 because once we get into Exodus 25, it's talking about like the Ark of the Testimony, the mercy seat. Here, Exodus 25, verse 9, it says, Make all of the sanctuary after the pattern of the tabernacle. You find out in Hebrews, this pattern is based on the one in heaven. So these are just pictures that I found. So the Ark of the Testimony with the cherubim on top, the mercy seat. These are the items that were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and so I put those right next to it. And here is another picture of inside the sanctuary. This would have been like Solomon's temple, what it would have looked like, because this was not the temporary, this has flooring and everything. But the setup of the spots, there was a curtain between the holy place and the most holy place. Here's the table of showbread and the seven branch candlestick. So I have that right next to Exodus 25, verse 23, and then 31. They are connected to that. Here in Exodus 28, we have Aaron's garments and Aaron was the high priest. And so this is a representation of what he wore. And it even tells you Exodus 28. And on the back side is another one that I found just on his outfits. And I, I think I just stumbled upon it. And I know that we're talking about Aaron right now, so it might not seem important, but we know that Jesus is our high priest. And so all of these things had meaning. It was representing the final fulfillment by Christ. So it just helps me to understand this. Everything has meaning. I found this chart online randomly, and it's the languages of the world where if you look at the word for Saturday, their word, Sabbat, Sabbatu, all those are representations of Sabbath. So it's just interesting that their word for Saturday was so close to the word Sabbath because it was that seventh day of the week. So I put that in Exodus 31 verse 12 through 17 because it's talking about the Sabbath. Then in Exodus 40, we come to this place setting up the tabernacle, verse 17. And I had found this picture randomly and I just thought it was a beautiful representation of them out in the wilderness setting up this temporary sanctuary, temporary tabernacle. And because I liked it so much, you know, you'd think I would have made it smaller for room for notes or whatever else, but I just love this picture. So I made it big and just put it into that spot. So in Leviticus 16 and 23, we learn about the Day of Atonement. And it's interesting, many of us know that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Feast of Passover. He was the Passover lamb. His legs were not broken. His blood saves us. So there was the typical Passover that they celebrated every year. And then Jesus was that ultimate fulfillment. So we have the typical service and the atypical service. And the same thing for all of the feast days, you're gonna see in most of them, they've been fulfilled. But the Day of Atonement, the ultimate fulfillment of this, has not been fulfilled. It's called the Day of Atonement, and it's interesting, you could say the plan of at one -ment with God. It's that final fulfillment. So we had the daily service where they were constantly bringing their animals. You, as the sinner, would put your hand on the head of the animal, confess your sins over that animal. That would cause that sin to get into the animal's blood, and that blood was taken into the sanctuary. So this happened every day, and all of your sins, you needed to do this. And then that blood was in there contaminating the sanctuary. And then one day per year, there was a day of atonement and only a high priest would go in. And there's even a final fulfillment for the day of atonement where we are gonna become fully at one with Christ and with God. And he's gonna live on earth, we're told in Revelation. And we're gonna be able to see God face to face. So this is part of that fulfillment. And so I have notes that I'd written in my Bible and I just typed it up into text blocks and added it here because it's so important to keep reading, keep learning. So I added that in there. Here's another one. I'm just gonna turn it this way. So this is, when you're reading the Old Testament especially, it will talk about this happened in the ninth month or during the month of Abib. And then I put all the feast days. And this is one where I got the idea from a study Bible and I wanted it in my Bible. And I forgot to mention, I put it with Leviticus 23, which are the feasts of the Lord. And so this one came like this with the, our months and then the Jewish months. And then I added in little text boxes with each of the feast days. And the one thing I just wanna mention because people might think that I've gone over the top with this is that we don't wanna start sacrificing a lamb, that kind of thing. Because Jesus is fulfilling all of these, the Jewish people were doing the typical and Jesus does the atypical 
He's the one-time fulfillment of these. I believe we need to have an understanding of it. And again, not because we're gonna start sacrificing a lamb and doing all of those things, but just because there was a purpose for everything that God did in the Old Testament. Now, this is a picture that I stumbled upon online when I was looking at the sanctuary. I think I was just trying to get a picture of the sanctuary and I found this one and I thought it was really neat. So I put it in with Numbers chapter two because it talks about the setup of the tribes. So then when I'm reading this, I can see the setup here. So it's interesting because you have the north, south, east, and west. All of it's important, even how they were set up directionally was important. So I love this because it shows visually what I'm reading about. And it's neat because even where it is, like Dan was on the side of the north, Judah is on the side of the east. We know Jesus came from the line of Judah. And it's interesting because Jesus is the king of the east. There's more to say about that, but that's all I'll say for this part of it. But here was the sanctuary in the middle. Number one was where Moses, Aaron, and his sons stayed. Then Koath, Gershon, and Merai. Those were of the Levi's. And they each of these groups had different jobs related to moving the sanctuary. As we get to this, you might wonder, this is actually different from the other one I showed. So I'll go back to that one and show you. So we have an Exodus. This is the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant, we have the jar of manna, the rod that budded, and then the Ten Commandments. But then in Deuteronomy 31 verse 24, we learn about this book of the law that Moses wrote that was placed on the outside of the ark. They were the scrolls, um, but the Ten Commandments were placed on the inside. On Those were on stone. So it shows the difference. There was a difference between the two things. So here's another map that was in conforming to Jesus. And it's the different judges and where they were located. And I thought that would be neat to have in my Bible in the book of Judges. The one thing I've always found confusing is all the different kings that are related to Judah and Israel. Once it divided, it will go back and forth between them. Just find it kind of confusing. And I found this chart. One thing it didn't have was a Shibosheth, which was the fourth son of King Saul. And he was a king and it caused the kingdom to be divided during his reign. So I added that in just using some text blocks. And then on the back of this sheet, I had found also these charts here and I just laid them out together and printed it on the back side. And so what I did was I added this chart before 1st and 2nd Samuels, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. So reading through those, you can see them and it also shows the prophets. Just find this helpful in understanding the flow of it. And this one also mentions the date. And so I just added that in. So I won't show that in each of the places but that's something I just think will be helpful. I had this one in my other Bible and I didn't glue it in and I just had it so I could move it as I read it. But I found that the sheet got very bent up and mangled. And so I thought if I just glue it before each of the books, it'll be easier to go back and read this and to use this information. And I probably really only needed one. And then actually I could have just added a tab so it'd be easy to find it, but just kind of a decision I made. Now, another one that they had in conforming to Jesus was this map of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And they referenced 1 Kings chapter 12. And in that section, you see that Jeroboam built a sanctuary in Bethel and Dan. So that was in verse 29. I just added that on there. And so I just thought that was a neat little map of the two kingdoms. And here when we get to 1 Kings 18, 20, it's all about Elijah's challenge to the prophets of Baal. So you have Carmel, Megiddo, and we know that there's gonna be a battle of Armageddon in the end times. And it's all about this decision that must be made between God and Baal to not halt between two opinions. So I added this text box and I added this map and it's just something I think that is very important as we face these end times. So there's the Megiddo. So I just found this helpful, interesting as you're reading it, that from the Valley of Megiddo, you can see Mount Carmel too. So I have these notes here so I can look into it more. When we get to Nehemiah, I noticed they had conforming to Jesus. They had a map of the time of Nehemiah. And so I thought that would be helpful to have here as I'm reading Nehemiah. And then as we come to the book of Job, and there were the friends that came to visit him. And I put some text boxes in of some information that I learned off of a sermon. Just a few. And then here's another one where they were attacked. And that happened in Job verse 13 through 19, I think right in this section. So that's what I chose to add here. Then when we come to Proverbs chapter six, verses 16 through 19, there's this list of the seven abominations the Lord hates. And I heard this message on it. 
And in my other Bible, I actually highlighted these things so it really stood out. And it's all about how we need to surrender ourselves to Christ. There's some additional information, so I added that in. So you won't be able to find this online because it's something that I created. So if you're interested in this and looking at it, let me know and I can send it to you. Then as we get to Ezekiel 8:16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. So a very sad thing, they've turned their back. And when I saw this turn between the porch and the altar, there's another place in Joel 2.17 where it says the same thing. So I just wanted a representation. And so I found this one online. It says between the porch and the altar. And this actually says the priest court. I'm not sure what all it means, but it feels important that it mentions that location. So I have it there and I think there's more meaning to it, but I haven't gotten to that. Plenty of room to write notes if I want to, but I've added it here. And as you can see, these, these pages are heavier. So they do kind of get in the way sometimes. So here is that same copy of that porch and the altar. And it's Joel 2:17, And it says, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. So there's something significant about this area. And this is a set of prayers that I really like. I do have a different Bible that I use for prayers, but these ones are so special to me that I also put it in this Bible. And then on here is a write-up that I liked the words. And so it's just on the back of that one. This is a map from Conforming to Jesus. It's Israel at the time of Jesus, first century AD. So it's a look at some of the areas. So as I'm reading, I can just flip forward and see where was that on the map? And then this is Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And it actually shows like Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus before the high priest and Peter's denial. And then this is traditional location. So I'm not sure how accurate everything is. I think there's a lot of guesses that people make, but it's as much as we know at this time. And so it's just to give me an idea of what happened where things were. This is a chart I found with the parables of Jesus and then the miracles of Jesus. And these were at the conforming to Jesus site. And here is a map that they had, the maps and sites of Jesus's ministry in Israel. And I liked that it has these sites. And so you can see how far Jesus traveled. It's really interesting. So I just have stuck this into this part before Matthew. And then here is, because Matthew starts with a genealogy, I have this genealogy. And so it does show the book of Luke and then how Matthew was different. As you'll actually see this also in the book of Luke chapter three. So this is one that I included in one of my studies related to the solution to the great controversy. Very fascinating how they're not sure the exact location where he was crucified, but there are these mountainous locations that look like skulls. And so when Jesus's crucifix was driven into the ground, it was like it was driving into the skull and we know that there was gonna be a bruise to Satan's skull. Jesus' crucifixion was a fatal blow. And then when Jesus was crucified and he said, it is finished, this was just a beautiful thing. I'm gonna read this first, verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, That is to say, a place of a skull. So I added that here. Now this one is very little writing. I had to squish it up to make it fit. And this is from one of my studies on the concept of hell. And so I created something with a lot of different verses to show. So if somebody asked me a question about it, I would have some references to go with. In the book of Luke chapter three, starting in verse 23, there's another genealogy. So I put in that same sheet here and it's not from conforming to Jesus. It's from something that randomly popped up and I like the looks of it. it. should come up very easily for you. In the book of John, in chapter five, there's this healing at the pool of Bethsaida. And so I looked into that and so I just added them together. And then when we come to John chapter 10, verse 23, it talks about Jesus walking in the temple in Solomon's porch. And that's mentioned at different places. So I found this and this write up and added these pictures. And so again, these are all ones that I just put together. So here in John chapter 19, we see that Christ was on the cross on the preparation day and that they didn't want his body to remain on the cross on the Sabbath day because this Sabbath day was also a high day. It was one of the feast days. So they took him off the cross and they laid him in a sepulcher. And then in John chapter 20, verse one, it says, then the first day of the week, which is Sunday, came Mary Magdalene. And so they discovered that Jesus is alive. And one thing that I saw on Facebook was this timing based on the different gospels of what time of day each event happens. I liked the look of it. So I went ahead and stuck it into this part in my Bible. I didn't add it to all the gospels. I might at some point, but 
something that I can reference. So I do like this one. The timings of it are not exact. Like this in Matthew 27, it actually just says that it happened in the early morning. I know this one actually does refer to 9 a.m. At noon, darkness covered the land, and at 3 p.m., Jesus died. But then this one doesn't actually say that it was at 6 p.m., but it something that I can reference. I mean, it was just a long, horrible day for Jesus. This is another map that was in Conforming to Jesus. It's on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And so these are the locations mentioned, and this is showing where they were all coming from to celebrate Pentecost. So then in Acts chapter 9, it talks about Saul's conversion. And so this again is conforming to Jesus. It's a map of his journeys. And then this is Paul's letters and missionary journeys. And so I just put it on the back. And so as you're going through Acts and then the letters that he wrote, and that's their view on it. And I can't say for sure that it's correct, um, but I have heard several times that 2 Timothy was his last letter. So when he's calling for Timothy to come and visit him, that he doesn't have much time. He knew that his death was imminent, so it kind of adds so much to when you read 2 Timothy knowing that Paul knew that was the end. Now this might seem like overkill, but when we get to Acts 13 and 14, there's another map that they had. And again, for some reason, it didn't print very well for me. It's a little bit blurry, so I'm not sure if I should have tried again. I glued it in there and something that you can make a decision about, but I thought it'd be kind of neat to have that in with Acts 13 and 14. And here's another one that they had, his second missionary journey, and has little write-ups along the way. And that goes with Acts 15 through Acts 18. So I stuck it in Acts 16. And here's his third missionary journey. This is another from Conforming to Jesus, and it has some of the write-ups, so I, I, I think that's cool. This is another Conforming to Jesus map. And it's the map of Paul's journey to Rome, Acts 27 and 28. So different stops along the way. Here's a combination of two different documents that I saw. This side was a document that had the whole armor of God and it had different verses. For example, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and it mentioned Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I thought that was really neat to see it in other spots. And then this is a children's prayer that I found and it, she had included these symbols. And so I put it on this side, Jesus put on us. And I think I changed it to the word us because that way you can pray corporately. You're praying for yourself and others. So that's the way I did that one. Um, so you won't find anything like this online. You can contact me if you want this. In the book of Hebrews, it talks a lot about Christ being our high priest. And he is not in the earthly sanctuary. He's up in the heavenly sanctuary. This is a sanctuary that the Lord pitched and not man. So this is this earthly sanctuary. That's what we know, what we're given for information and how it was laid out. This was the one that I used in the Day of Atonement and I just tilted it so it would line up with each of the pieces and the fact that he's in heaven and this realization that he had moved into the heavenly sanctuary. So I added that. So that again is not something that you'll find online just like this, but you can put it together using the computer or let me know. Now this one I wrote very messy, but this is in Hebrews 9. It talks about the daily and the yearly. There were things that were done. We talked about that with the Day of Atonement uh, and there's this type and anti-type and I liked these charts so I put them together for that just as a reminder. And this was an insert I created related to what was nailed to the cross and just some information that I want to be reminded of. And some more things about the fact that the Ten Commandments were inside the ark, written on stone by the finger of God. And these were the scrolls placed on the side of the ark. Just some information about that old covenant versus the new covenant. And then this picture here, this is blown up the same thing. I think it's an amazing representation of how Christ was the fulfillment of these things. So we don't take part in this because we have Christ who died on the cross, who was laid and he was resurrected. So Christ is the lamb and the high priest and he is our heavenly high priest. And this was something connected with that document. I think it was right with that and I just put it on the back and it's some verses about who Christ is and I liked that so I've just added that to the back of that sheet. So that was connected with Hebrews 10 because Christ is the perfect sacrifice. So at this point, this is step one done for me with all the different inserts. So as I go, I've got information. And something I know that as I'm working on transferring notes into my Bible, I'm gonna be creating inserts to take the place of some of these notes that are so intense and scribbled and messy and 
Some of it I'm going to need to continue to write. It's just gonna make more sense. But some of it I am gonna be typing up. One of these things I found was so neat the sealed tribes and how each of the names that are mentioned in Revelation 7, I mean, when you put the meaning of the names together, it says a beautiful message here. And so I think that would be a neat thing. I could probably combine that into one side. And there are two tribes that are omitted and here are the reasons they might have been omitted. So I'll be typing this up and adding it to Revelation. You find as you study Revelation, the church's seals and trumpets happen simultaneously and they're giving information over pretty much the same period of time. And so I want to create a chart that shows what happened in each thing just so I have an overview of all the information because it gives you different sides of the information written here. Churches was about that time period from a pastoral perspective. Table of showbread was from a historical perspective. And the altar of incense or the trumpets, the seven trumpets was from a military judgment perspective. And so each one has information about a time period. And so I want them all, I want to be able to see them all together. So my next step will be to start adding in notes and also to add in these tabs of questions that I have from the Bible. Those haven't stopped probably. So I'll probably be adding these in over there so I can continue to search and wonder to learn more and more about God and this wonderful gift that he's given us of the word of God. So that was my first part of setting up my new Bible. I hope it gave you lots of ideas. Conformingtojesus.com has a lot of great maps and charts and very helpful items. So enjoy this process. Enjoy your time in God's word. It's such a blessing. Mm -hmm.